Hello and welcome everyone to the Intrepid Museum's live virtual programming. Thank you so much for joining us today for Code Breakers. Now, my name is Alicia. I'm an educator at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum in New York City. I'll be your host today for the program. And just as a reminder, the museum's live streams are free, but if you'd like to support us in delivering this content, please click in the comments or in the description below. So feel free to use the chat today to say hello. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Let us know if you've ever been to the Intrepid Museum before. And of course, if you've got any questions, you can go ahead and put them there as well. Now at the Intrepid Museum, our mission is to honor our heroes, educate the public and inspire our youth. And today we are going to be talking a bit about spying and espionage. So we are gonna talk a little bit about the ways that the Navy could communicate while at sea and also how we keep pilots safe by keeping them somewhat hidden in plain sight and also keeping the information that they might be carrying safe by encoding it too. So a quick recap for those of you who may not be familiar, this is the Intrepid Museum. So we are located inside of a historic World War II aircraft carrier docked right on the west side of Manhattan in the Hudson River. On site, we have a historic Cold War era submarine. We have the Space Shuttle Enterprise and a British Airways Concorde as well. Now, it was constructed way back in 1943 for a very specific purpose. It was made during a time where we were fighting countries all the way across oceans. And it became really important to be able to bring our airplanes with us to these very, very far away locations. So while we were fighting these battles, we were at sea. We needed a way to also launch and land our planes while in the middle of the ocean and thus the aircraft carrier was born. So the USS Intrepid is an aircraft carrier. It was in service from 1943 to 1974. It served in World War II, the Cold War, and the Vietnam War. And later, after it was decommissioned, it was actually rescued from the scrapyard and turned into a museum. Believe it or not, next year, we are going to be celebrating our 40th birthday as a museum, too. Can you imagine? Now, of course, while at sea, the Navy wanted to protect its aviators and its ships. We wanted, of course, to keep them safe while they were off in their dangerous missions. And one way that they could do this was by hiding them in plain sight. Now, tell me in the chat, does anyone know what it's called when something is right in front of you, but so kind of hard to see? Maybe it uses a certain color to help to blend in with its surroundings. You know, a lot of animals might do that. The military actually did too. So in order to disguise these big hunks of metal, right? They use something very particular. Let us know if, if you happen to know what it is in the chat, but they use this thing called camouflage. Yeah, so camouflage can be done using colors or patterns or all sorts of designs. And, you know, if you know any camouflage things, let us know in the chat too, all right? Uh, what are some animals maybe that you can think of that uses camouflage to protect themselves? Can you think of any? Let us know, pop it in the chat. Hi there, Brian. Let us know if you can think of any camouflage uh, animals that use camouflage. And by the way, did you happen to see the hunter hiding in plain sight in this picture there? There he is, wearing, of course, his camouflage outfit. Now, there are actually a few different types of camouflage that we're going to talk about today. The very first is commonly found in the animal world, and it's probably what you think of when you think of that kind of military camo look pattern, all right? Now, this type is called obscuring. Now, this means blending in using similar colors or patterns as your surrounding areas. So a great example of this is right here. This is a flounder. So they've got colors and patterns that help them to really easily disguise themselves with the ocean floor. So take a look at this picture here. Can you see the flounder? Oh, there he is. So that sandy color looks exactly like the sand that he's swimming over. So that is going to help to protect him based on his surroundings. Now, another example of this is also the snowshoe hair. During the warmer months, it's got this brown coat of fur that helps it blend in with its woody and grassy surroundings, like you can see on the left. But when the snow starts to fall and it gets colder, its fur turns white. So it can then easily blend in with its snowy Arctic surroundings. So it's a really good example of adaptation here too, as well as obscuring camouflage, adapting, of course, to its surroundings. 
Now, the next one that we can talk about then is called disruptive camouflage. Whoa, what are we looking at here? So that is using highly contrasting colors and patterns to confuse onlookers. So a really great example of this in the natural world is zebras. Look at that. They often travel in these giant herds of hundreds or even thousands of them, and they have very distinct stripes, really, uh, to help to confuse their predators. So looking at this picture, where does one zebra end? Where does the next one begin? How many are we actually looking at in this herd? It's quite confusing, isn't it? Even just looking at this picture here. Also, when they're all moving together, it actually creates kind of an optical illusion that really messes with the perceived direction of their movement. So you can imagine how, of course, that would be really helpful for the zebra to outlast, say, a lion, right, out in the, uh, the natural world there. Now, another one we can talk about then is counter shading. Now, counter shading camouflage is a very popular one for some of our airplanes. That means using different colors or different patterns on the top and the bottom to blend in from both above and below. Now, oftentimes the top part is gonna be darker and the bottom part is gonna be lighter, like you can see here with these penguins. They've got dark backs and white bellies, so they can blend in with the darkness of the ocean when the predators, let's say they're swimming over, they look down, they blend in with the darkness down there in the water. And then they also blend in with the light of the sky that is coming through the water up above. So if the predator is under them, looking up, it's gonna see the white belly and it's gonna blend in with the light. So many other animals also have this though, things like dolphins and sharks and whales. What can you think of? Let me know in the chat. What else uses counter shading? It's very popular in uh, the animal world. Now the last form of camouflage that we can talk about here is called mimicry. So mimicry is literally copying what something looks like in order to look and appear like something else. Almost imagine like you're wearing a costume. So you're not blending in necessarily, but you're putting on a mask and you're saying, I am this thing. So often that means you might, you know, want to maybe look like yourself, but maybe a big scarier version of yourself in order to protect yourself or, uh, you know, maybe something else that's maybe non non threatening at all. Right. Um, so for example, um, you know, you can see in this here, you've got butterflies um, or moths that have this color pattern that looks like eyes. And yeah, looking at that, wow, it really does look like the eyes of an owl. So that's really helpful to scare away someone who maybe might want to eat him, right? Uh, and then on the other hand, you've also got this. All right, now this is a bug that can disguise itself to look like a piece of nature. So they blend in, uh, yes, using obscuring, right? But they also literally look exactly like a stick or a leaf like you can see here. So they actually mimic the nature that they are living in. So those animals are actually really smart. They are easily looked over uh, because it's just a commonplace thing. And now they live to tell their, the tale to uh, their little bug friends for another day. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you now a few things in the museum, the Intrepid Museum, and we are gonna get a chance to see how camouflage was used in a number of ways on board the Intrepid. Now, the first image that I'm going to show you here is this one. All right, now the Intrepid is a giant ship. It is 913 feet long. It's so long that you could just about play three games of football on it uh, on top of the flight deck at the same time to give you some perspective. So yeah, you can imagine it's gonna be a little bit difficult to camouflage this giant floating airport in the middle of the ocean. So how did we do it? Well, take a look at this. Believe it or not, this is the Intrepid from 1944. So this is how it was painted during World War II. Now, this form of camouflage is something called dazzle paint. Dazzle paint. So you can see these blocks of colors, right? The colors are actually called dull black, ocean gray, and light gray. Not too creative. But here's a question for you, everyone. We're going to play a little game. Which type of camouflage do you think this is? So go ahead and type a number in the chat for me. Which type of camouflage is dazzle paint? All right, so type a one if you think it's obscuring. Type two if you think it's disruptive. Type three if you think it's counter shading. And type four if you think it's mimicry. All right, 
So take a look, think it through again. Remember, obscuring is you know something that blends in with your surrounding. Disruptive means it kind of confuses you. Countershading means you've got top and bottom different colors. And mimicry is you look like something else. So let's see, we've got some numbers coming in the chat. Vashson says two. Prepaid Obsidian says two disruptive. All right, Frankly L says three. Excellent, good guesses, everyone. Now, everyone, I will say though, if you said two, you would be correct because it is in fact using number two, disruptive camouflage. And that's because it would travel in its own herd, really, kind of like zebras. It traveled in something called a fleet. And they were all painted these really crazy patterns like that. So when they were close together, close to one another, it was kind of tricky to know where one ended and where the next one began. And even when they were moving together, like we talked about with the zebras, which direction they were heading at a glance. So after World War II, the Intrepid uh, actually was painted what it is now, this low visibility gray, kind of plain, not as exciting as, you know, razzle dazzle paint there. But back then, a lot of ships actually had that dazzle paint. It was very, very common. And it was very confusing, too. Look at that picture on the right there. Is that one ship? Is it two ships? Is it three ships? Who knows? Right? <laughs> Looking at that picture, especially because it's a black and white photograph, a little bit tricky to see there. Now, here are some other pictures of some really bonkers examples of dazzle paint. Uh, here you've got stripes, you've got swirls, you've got zigzags, all kinds of things to confuse people and confuse it did. Um, this was even used actually back in World War I, by the way, too. So all in all, they figured, yeah, you know, you've got this huge ship sailing through the water. There's no way we're going to blend in with the ocean entirely. We can't, you know, mask ourselves to look like a giant whale floating through the ocean or something. So best bet, confuse them. And that's what they did. Now, here, everyone, is another type of camouflage. So take a look at this plane here. If you've ever been to our museum or seen maybe another one of our programs, you've probably seen this plane before. This is actually one of my favorite planes that we have on the ship. It is the oldest plane in our collection. It's from World War II. And this is the Avenger. All right, the Avenger. It is a torpedo bomber. So when we look at the Avenger here and we look at its patterns, we look at its colors, what type of camouflage do you think we are looking at here? What kind of camouflage is it using? So once again, in the comments for me, type a one if you think this is obscuring, type a two if you think this is disruptive, type three if you think it's countershading, and type four if you think it is mimicry. All right, so I'll give you uh, a couple seconds to go ahead and answer that in. All right, go ahead, type your guesses. Just really take a quick look here. You know, take a look at that color scheme. Think about what we talked about here. All right, we got some answers coming in. Vashon says three, Frankly L says four, Prepaid Obsidian says one. Oh, wow, we are all over the spectrum. Frankly L says R, that might've been a typo. <laughs> uh, Richard Train says C, okay. All right, good guesses, everyone. So the correct answer is counter shading. That was number three, counter shading, or I guess C if Richard said C. Uh, so yeah, this plane uses counter shading and it's actually got three colors involved in its counter shading. So the very top part of it is a dark blue. The middle of the fuselage, the main body part of it there is a light blue. And then the underside of it, as you can see here is white. So thinking about that, and also kind of thinking about, you know, the shark friend here or the penguins we talked about before. What do you think it's trying to blend in with? What do you think the, for example, the dark blue color is for? What does that blend in with? And then why do we have the lighter blue? And then why the white underneath? Again, thinking about like the penguins, right? <laughs> Richard Train says sharks. <laughs> yes. So the top dark blue part, everyone, it blends in again with the dark color of the ocean. So if you, and yes, Bastion says bottom is the sky uh, and the blue is the sky and the clouds. Very good. Yeah. So if you imagine oh, you, you are a plane, all right, you're flying above the Avenger, looking down on it, it's going to blend in with the ocean, the dark blue of it underneath it. And then if you happen to be flying right alongside of it, if you look over, it's going to kind of look like the blue of the sky, maybe. Hopefully, it's a nice day outside. Uh, and then if you are underneath it, and let's say you're on a ship, you're looking up, 
uh, you are going to see, of course, the uh, the white color, and that is going to hopefully you know, blend in more with the clouds up above. So uh, Avengers are really, really good examples of counter shading. And that's actually the reason why many Avengers, um, you know, were able to get by <laughs> during the war because that camouflage really helped them and helped to protect the pilots that flew them too. Now here is another example of camouflage, all right? So everyone, this is the MiG-21. This is a very, very fast jet plane. Uh, this is actually a Vietnamese plane. And this plane would have been flying, of course, during the Vietnam War. So when we look at the MiG-21 here, you can see it's got some very distinct coloring on it. So again, I ask you, which type of camouflage is this one using? Hmm, all right, think closely here now, look closely. In the comment section, if you think it's obscuring, type one. If you think it's disruptive, type two. If you think it is counter shading, type three. And if you think it's mimicry, type four. All right, so really think about this now. Think about what we talked about earlier. Look at you know some of the characteristics here. Think about uh, you know where it might have been flying. Tell me what you think. What type of camouflage do you think the MiG-21 is using? It has the green coloring at the top, but also look, it's got kind of a lighter coloring on the bottom. All right, Vashton says three. Uh, frankly, L says one. All right, so let's see everyone. If you said three, counter shading again, you'd actually be correct. Now, if you said obscuring, you could be right as well because it is kind of blending in with something, right? It does sort of look like that sort of jungle camo pattern that you might have seen before on the top, right? Um, but specifically, more specifically, again, this one is actually counter shading because of where it's going to be flying. So it flies over the jungles in Vietnam. So it's going over the trees. And if you're looking down, of course, it's going to blend in with the, the jungle trees and everything underneath it. And then again, if you are under and you look up, it is going to blend in a bit more with the sky because of its light underside. Kind of a trick question there, but oh, I didn't fool all of you, excellent. All right, now on to this one. Next to it on the flight deck up there, we've got this plane here. This is the MiG-17. So kind of like the little brother to the MiG-21, also a Vietnamese plane, but look closely at this one. This one's a little different. So, once again, which kind of camouflage do you think that the MiG-17 is using? Is this obscuring, type one? Is this disruptive, type two? Is this counter shading, type three? Or is this mimicry, type four? All right, now look at the patterns in the colors of the plane here. Again, think about where it might be trying to blend in. People are already changing their answers here. Um, this one is a little bit slower than the MiG-21. This was a fighter jet, so it's going to be fighting other planes up in the sky. Uh, and, you know, because it's uh, up in the sky and maneuvering around in the clouds, it, uh, it you know, that might inform it a little bit. Uh, let's see, we've got some two, one, four and one. <laughs> Lots of guesses here. All right, so yeah, it is trying to blend in with the sky, but also blend in with the clouds. So if you said one obscuring for this one, then you would be correct. So yeah, some great answers out there. Good, good, good. So this one actually hides itself in plain sight in the sky using all those different shades of blue. And here are uh, actually, you know, some examples of it. You might see it flying in the sky um, or, you know, maybe you might not see it so well. Um, so you can really see how the colors and the patterns there really help to obscure it or hide the plane uh, while in the sky flying around. Now, right next to the MiG-17, we've also got this plane. This is the Crusader, another very fast supersonic jet that was flown by the United States Navy. And if you notice, how can you not notice? It has a very interesting painting on it. Maybe you've seen something like this painted on a plane before. <laughs> so what are we looking at here? This is a big scary shark face. This mouth with sharp pointy teeth on the front. So I want you to use your imaginations here a little bit, all right? Bear with me on this one, everyone. Use your imaginations and tell me now what type of camouflage might this crusader be using? Is this obscuring, disruptive, counter shading or mimicry think about that all right type a one two three or four in the chat let me know what you think which type of camouflage 
is the closest, let's say, do you think? <laughs> Some people say it doesn't actually use camouflage, but you know, use your imagination, roll with me on here. Which do you think is the closest uh, to what it was? Um, you know, if we're really thinking about it, how might this plane kind of be hiding in plain sight? <laughs> All right, got some answers coming in here. Excellent, it's supposed to be a shark, yes, four. It's just really fast, that's true. Uh, it's supposed to be intimidating, absolutely. So we got another four from David Paul Noelton. Uh, excellent, yeah. So just a white line in the sky, sounds like mimicry to me, says Vashson. So everyone, looking at this, we might think that, you know, maybe it's kind of mimicking a certain animal, right? Because it looks like a shark, kind of. It's mimicking a shark. I mean, I'd say sharks are, are pretty fierce, right? So does this kind of look like a shark flying through the sky like a Sharknado? No, not really. But would it kind of maybe scare pilots, you know, be a little intimidating, as frankly said, uh, to, you know, maybe someone else that's flying alongside of it, look over and see these big teeth flying next to it? Maybe I would be scared. I don't really like sharks. So, yes, the answer, everyone, is mimicry. All right. Kind of a funny one. Not really, maybe, but it's close. Now, there are actually other animals that do that, too. For example, snakes. So on the left, you've got a coral snake. And the coral snake is actually very, very dangerous. It is very, very poisonous. There is a saying that helps you to remember that. They say red touches yellow kills a fellow. Remember that one, all right? But, and you can see that again with the red coloring touching the yellow uh, bands on the snake there on the left. But there is actually another snake, the Scarlet King snake, that looks very, very similar to the coral snake. In fact, it has almost exactly the same colors. But if you look closely, the pattern is just slightly different. And on this one, the red is actually touching the black, not the yellow. So the rest of the rhyme goes red touches black, poison lack, or friend of Jack. Sometimes they say it a little differently. So that means that you can tell that the king snake, the one on the right, is safe because it's the, the red sections that are touching the black bands. And the coral snake, the one on the left, is not safe because, again, the red is touching the yellow. So they look really, really similar, though, right? Commonly confused. Um, I know if I was out in a field, I would just run away regardless because I don't really like snakes either. But they look super, super similar. Um, and this is a good example of snake mimicry, where a harmless species has actually evolved to mimic the visual cues of a dangerous one so that predators don't eat it, which is really, really smart, right? All right, everyone. So uh, before we carry on here, I want to pause and see if we have any uh, questions, any questions at all. Uh, why did the Avenger need camouflage, right? So the Avenger, like I said, is a torpedo bomber, all right? So torpedo bombers actually move pretty low and slow. This is World War II. They were using propellers. They weren't jet planes. They didn't move quite as fast. And the way they would go is, you know, they'd, they'd come in towards a ship, again, flying very low to the water and kind of slow, getting on that steady straight path. They would drop their torpedo into the water, which would then you know, speed on ahead and hopefully intersect with the ship that they were trying to hit. Um, after they dropped the torpedo though, they would pull up and get out of there. But because they were flying so low and so close to the enemy um, and slowly, that was why the camouflage really needed to kick in. They needed to hide in plain sight. If you had some really flashy, you know, I don't know, gold and yellow and you know, bright orange thing flying through the air, you're gonna see that, right? So having um, that counter shade camouflage on the Avenger was really important because of the function of the plane itself. Good question. All right, any others? Do all planes use camouflage? No, they do not. So of course we looked at the Crusader. I guess that wasn't really camouflage with mimicry. Um, but you'll notice actually that the jet planes uh, later on, they uh, are oftentimes just kind of painted again, that low visibility gray sort of color. Um, you will see other things on it though, some symbols, um, some you know markings and things that represent different things uh, that we talk about in some other programs actually, which give it a little bit of flair and help to distinguish between them. Uh, but actually, Actually, no. Uh, you know, sometimes they want to save um, weight, so they don't want to paint the whole thing like that. Not all planes use uh, a camouflage like we've talked about, though. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe one more question. What is the most effective form of camouflage? It really depends on your environment, right? So if you are 
you know, like the flounder we talked about, the obscuring camouflage, it really helps to blend in with its surroundings. But again, you can't really have that type of camouflage on a ship that's out in the middle of the ocean. It'd be a little strange to, I don't know, maybe paint half of your ship looking like the ocean and half of it looking like the sky or like land, let's say, right? So if you go into a different area, it's not really going to blend in properly in all areas. So it really depends on your particular um, you know, situation. Uh, and I see frankly also had a question. What is a Sharknado? <laughs> oh, my friend. Uh, there was a, there was a, a, a movie about a tornado that had sharks in it <laughs> a while ago. That's all. Nothing to worry about. What about Razzle Dazzle says Scott? Yeah, that's like the dazzle paint. Exactly. So that's what the ships would use um, in order to blend in with camouflage. But again, if you had a ship like that nowadays, it would really actually kind of stand out more than anything else. Um, having the dazzle paint in the fleets together is really what helped it to uh, protect itself. All right, my friends. So let's go ahead and move on here. Now, also up on the Intrepid's flight deck, we have this plane here. Now, this one isn't really using camouflage to blend in and hide. This one's actually trying to stand out and trying to be a little more noticeable. This is called the Mentor. And it is called this because it was used as a training plane. And yeah, Richard trains as trainer, exactly. It was used to train pilots to fly in the Navy back in the 1950s. So a great way to think about this is if you've ever taken driver's ed or maybe seen someone practicing driving a car, you know, going down the street, they've oftentimes got like a little sticker or a sign or like, you know, one of those little light up things on the roof, right? Um, something to let everyone else in the area driving nearby be like, hey, by the way, this person is learning. So you might want to watch out, be nice, maybe avoid them, drive a little more defensively, you know, just in case something goes wrong. This is actually why I learned to drive in an empty parking lot just in case. So this plane was the exact same idea. They painted it this bright red and white because it's going to be very visible. Once again, like I said, if you got like a neon orange plane flying around, you're going to notice it. Very, very, very visible up in the sky. Um, you're going to see it. You're going to know, hey, maybe don't get too close because we're training this pilot. Um, now, in nature, actually, there are animals that do the very same thing. Uh, the snakes, for example, that we just looked at, for one, they've got the yellow and the red, very eye-catching. Um, you've also got frogs, right? So some of them have that very high contrast, bright color um, that's going to attract attention to it to kind of warn people and tell other animals to stay back. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of like a big bright red stop sign. Hopefully it's going to get your attention and you are going to stop. So this, for example, um, is uh, one of those like poison dark frogs, you know, that are very, very, very poisonous. And you're going to know because they are bright red out in the open there. Now, here is something else, though, with similar markings. Let me know in the comments. Uh, and yeah, Richard sends his baby on board. Exactly, exactly. So let me know in the comments, everyone, what you think this helicopter was used for. Have you ever seen uh, these colors on something else out and about in your community? Mm. Looking at these colors, you might be able to figure it out. Fashion says medic. Yeah. Coast Guard Rescue, all right, yep, yep. So absolutely, everyone, looking at these colors, it kind of, you know, might make you think of something that oftentimes we rescue people or take care of people, right? So, uh, you know, thinking about it, it might kind of look like an ambulance, right? So um, in this situation, these bright colors, again, are really easy to spot, which is great if you are trying to rescue people at sea as well. And that's exactly what this helicopter did, too. This was exactly a Coast Guard rescue helicopter. Uh, it actually could float on the water. It's got these big buoys over the wheels that you can see there. Uh, and, uh, yeah, frankly, Elsa, I think this helicopter, or, well, heliplane, is used to rescue people. Exactly. This one was used to rescue people. They had a large basket inside that they would throw overboard and uh, help to retrieve them from the water. Very good. Now, this plane never actually took off from the Intrepid, but we are very lucky to have it. This is the fastest plane ever built. This is the Lockheed A-12. Now this is a CIA spy plane and it could actually go Mach 3. So that is three times the speed of sound. That is over 2,100 miles per hour. Phew, 
really, really fast. Uh, and it also actually could go up to about 80,000 feet high. So that is so high, actually, that the pilot had to wear a pressurized suit, just like an astronaut, in order to breathe up there. Very, very low atmosphere up there. So uh, this was during the Cold War in the 1960s. So, of course, the main job of the A-12 was to spy on the Soviet Union. So it was supposed to fly really, really fast and really, really high and take a whole bunch of pictures, right? So this was a spy plane. Now, if I told you this was a spy plane and that this was camouflaged, you could probably guess, well, yes, oftentimes they probably flew it during a certain time of day, all right? This plane, of course, spied on the Soviet Union, oftentimes flown at night. We got that black uh, paint on there too. But actually it was so fast and technology was getting so good at that point, we kind of stopped relying on our eyes to find planes and started relying a lot more on radar. Um, the A-12 was really special because it had special paint on it that uh, could reflect and or deflect the radar really. It would scatter it and make it look like the plane was bigger than it was or that the plane was moving at a slower speed or coming you know, from a different direction and really start to confuse the radar. Um, and yeah, Richard Train says, no angled surfaces to not reflect radar. Exactly, the curves of it, everything about this plane was designed with speed and with stealth in mind for sure. Uh, so again, this is uh, you know, camouflage in a way as well. It really also worked against the radar with its special paint and all of the, the curving sweeping lines of it too. Now, all of these camouflage strategies um, that the planes used were, of course, to make sure that pilots and sailors and the spies, right, were safe while they were going on their missions. But now we are going to shift a little bit and talk about how the sailors and the pilots were able to keep their communication secret using codes. Now, we are going to take a look inside of this area of the Intrepid. This is up on the flight deck. This is an area called the island. And that is where a lot of the navigation and the communications were all based, um, kind of all in one central area there. So you're literally going to be steering, you know, the ship up there at the helm, but it's also where they've got a lot of their communication stuff. So in the bridge for navigation, you can see a lot of maps for plotting, right? So um, figuring out where they are heading and where they're going. Uh, you'll also see lots of instruments like radar that help us with navigation, help us looking for other planes and things. Uh, very, very busy area and very important area as well. And as you're walking through here, and you can actually do this if you come visit our ship, by the way, you can check out these areas. But as we walk through this area and we move a little bit closer to the front of the island, you are actually going to see this board right up in the front of that room. Now, if you look closely at it, you can see some words. All right, I'll make it a little bigger for you. Maybe you can make some of these words out here. You can see some words. You can see, for example, right in the center, it says CV-11 USS Intrepid. All right, but then you're also gonna see things like New Jersey and Miami and Independence and Iowa all these other kind of interesting names on here. Well, these were all names of ships that are in, again, what we call a fleet or a group of ships. Now they all stay close and in a formation to stay safe. And for a time, the Intrepid was actually something called the flagship or the head ship in the fleet. So that's why you can see the Intrepid right there in the middle and it's being protected by everyone else around it. But remember, it had the really important job of having planes take off and land from the flight deck. So they wanted to keep everyone safe and having it right in the center was a great way to do that. Now, our ship is really long, remember. So imagine, you know, you're looking out. Might be hard to see things directly in front of you. You've got planes all over the flight deck. They're launching, they're landing. So you know, they really started to rely on their instruments a lot to be able to navigate around. Um, they had things like compasses and equipment to be able to figure out their bearing, uh, which direction they were going. And in order to communicate with people all over the ship as well, to know these things and to let others know to help them move, right? So they actually used these things here, these sound powered telephones, all right? They may look like regular telephones, but they actually use the power and the physical properties 
of your voice's vibrations to work. Imagine like um, vibrating wax papers to move it along the line so people can hear on the other end. So you start off with a little bit of electricity, but really all of that in there, uh, or rather you start off with your sound and then you've got a little bit in there to transmit it. Um, but for the most part, you know, if you imagine kind of like you've got two paper cups, you attach them with a string and you pull it tight to be able to talk to your friends. It's kind of similar to that. So the sound waves can travel through the line that way. And it really just added another level of security to all of the messages that they told each other while they were on board instead of, you know, talking over a telephone line or even worse, like a cell phone tower today that maybe someone else could you know, intercept and pick up from another cell tower. Um, so they had to be very secretive. And that was another way that they were able to do it. This sort of more, you know, practical means of doing it. Uh, and yeah, Vahanara says batteries not included. There you go. <laughs> now, another way that they talked between decks was even more simple. Just like this. All right. So uh, maybe you've even used one of these at like a playground before. This is called a talk tube. So we uh, actually have one in our Explorium that you can test out as well. This is a piece of metal that's kind of shaped like a horn or a megaphone on one end. You just talk right on into it, as you can see this guy doing in that photo. And uh, your voice travels down this pipe quite literally, it's just an empty pipe, all the way down to another end somewhere else on the ship where they can listen to it on the other end too. Uh, now, that is a really great way, of course, to talking to people on your ship, right? Hopefully the other person can hear you if they're on the other end, maybe they're in the, the right room to know that you're talking to them, right? But what about if you have to communicate with people that are outside of the ship, maybe on another ship, let's say? Well, you don't want to necessarily just, you know, scream loud across the water, whatever you want to say, because you don't, you, don't, you don't know who's listening. You don't know who can hear right? you, right? Maybe it's a private conversation. So you probably want to use some sort of a code to get your message across so that no one can pick it up. <laughs> Richard Train, my girlfriend has one in each ear and can hear everything I say and think, wow, okay. <laughs> so yes, uh, Richard Train, more than flashing flags, exactly. That leads us to one of the most famous codes, everyone. This is international morse code all right so this is what it looks like on the left here it is a system of dots and dashes that can spell out letters and numbers so you can actually spell out whole words and phrases so everyone at home i'm going to play some morse code for you now and i want you to see if you can decipher what it says based on the key here might help to maybe grab you know a pen and paper or something but you don't have to you can just try to do it by ear so this is what you're going to need to crack the code, all right? You've got this uh, the system here of the dots and dashes with the letters next to it. This is your key. So listen to the dots and listen to the dashes and find the corresponding sound um, for what word is going to be spelled out here. Now, I'll play it for you uh, independently first. Uh, the dits and dahs, exactly, the beeps and bops. <laughs> you guys are great today. All right, so the uh, dot is going to sound like this. All right, this is just going to be this little blip, this little beep, and it sounds like this. All right, play it for you again. It's that boop. Great, now the dash is gonna be a little longer, and it's gonna sound like this. All right, so that longer beep, just like that. So you've got your dots. I don't know if you heard the car outside. You've got a dot. There you go. And you've got dashes. Excellent. All right. So I'm going to spell out now for you a three-letter word. And let's see if you can figure it out. And write for me in the comments, what word am I spelling out in Morse code? Now, I'm going to play it for you a few times. And here we go. See if you can figure this out. All right, here it is again. There's a little pause in between each letter too. Once again, you've got the dots, boop, and the dashes, boop. All right, the beeps and bops, the dits and does. All right, one more time, everyone, here we go. Richard Trent says, oh, it's too fast. Yeah, it goes pretty fast. These people are really good at it. But I'm going to pause now. I'm going to go through it one more time, and I'm going to pause in between each letter. So hopefully that'll help you to uh, be able to distinguish. Here we go. All 
All right, that was the first one. Da, 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 da. Here's the second one. Da, 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 da. And here's the third one. Da, 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 da. All right, so if you're having trouble with figuring it out, I'll give you a little bit of a hint. This hint is it's a command that you might give to an airplane. Hmm. So it starts dot, dot, dash, dot, then dot, dash, dot, dot. Oh, all right, we're starting to have some, some thoughts here. And the last one is dash, dot, dash, dash. All right. And the answer, everyone, is, oops, sorry, the answer is fly. The word is fly, F-L-Y. So everyone, keep your eye on the letter F, all right, to start off with, and see if you can follow along looking for the letters F, L, and Y as I play this one last time. Here we go. There you go, all right. So that is how Morse code works. If you couldn't get it, don't worry. There are people whose entire jobs are to figure out how to translate Morse code. And it is kind of an older system too. It is still around though. Uh, so, you know, if you love this, study up. I'll bet you could probably figure it out in no time, but absolutely, it can be a little tricky to catch on your first glance. All right, now everyone, Morse code is one way that we can communicate with other ships. Uh, another way though is using flags. Now oftentimes you will associate a flag with a country, right, in a way, kind of a, a code, right, in itself. It's a symbol that represents the country. So we ships actually use signal flags, all right? We use a different kind of flag that can send messages and each flag represents a letter or a number two. And these actually just get hung out on a line, kind of like you're hanging out some laundry here. Um, this is actually a photograph of a ship that came by to visit us. Uh, I think actually it was during Fleet Week in the past. Uh, so you can see lots of, you know, these colorful flags out there. Uh, on this ship, maybe it said something, but it also might have just been just very colorful to look at as well. But there's actually a key for all of these flags, everyone. So uh, take a look at the images that you can see here. And I'm gonna ask you another question now. See if you can find the corresponding letters for each of these flags. And let me know what the message says. See if you can decode this message right here with the flag code. All right, so take a look. Look at the, again, the colors, the symbols. All right, take a look at the groupings to be able to spell something out here. And this one might be a little bit easier than Morse code because you can kind of take your time a little bit. All right, but take a look here. What's really great as well is when you've got um, flags that are doubled up so you don't have to kind of check again. So if you already happen to know one, if you see it repeated there, oftentimes you can just go, oh, I did that already. So you can figure that out. So taking a look here again, you've got the first letter got a white square with a red diamond in it. So just kind of look at that key, see if you can figure out what letter that might be. The next one, it's kind of like a checkerboard. Compare with that. All right, and let's see if we can come up with what this might say. Again, something that might be found on a ship, a message that one might give to someone who is, let's say, controlling a ship. Hmm. All right, and we had a winner already. All right, good job, Vashson. The answer is full steam ahead. <laughs> Richard, it says dinner time. All right, <laughs> not quite, but close. Uh, so everyone, if you look again at the, uh, the two words, the second two words, rather, um, you've got some repeated letters in there, right? E and A uh, are in both of those. So that's an easy thing you can quickly be able to look at and go, oh, I already did that one. Very easy to do. Um, but yeah, just like a language that you might learn uh, and you know be able to read or write, these are also something that is very commonplace for people to be able to instantly recognize uh, and understand. Now here's another one. See if you can figure this one out. Less letters for you this time. This one is actually on the Intrepid 2. So see if you can see what this one spells out. Look closely at these letters. There's only four here, all right? What do you think this one says? What do you think? What do you think? We've got a blue and white checkerboard. 
We've got a solid red one that's got kind of an interesting little cutout in it. We've got a uh, yellow square. And then we've got one that has yellow and blue half and half on it. What does that say? Anyone know? Just tell me in the chat. What do you think it says? Any, anyone know? Confused maybe? Oh yeah, Richard Train's a little confused. NB what? Huh. <laughs> now everyone, it might look like I might have kind of messed up, right? Maybe spelling's not my strong suit, but no. It is actually correct what you are probably transcribing right now. Yes, NBQK. Kind of strange. What is that? That's not a, a word that we're familiar with. Well, it's actually Intrepid's call name. It was another nickname for the Intrepid, again, a code name. So a secret name that was used so that others didn't know which ship was talking or being talked to. So that adds an extra layer of code to your code, which actually makes it a little bit harder to crack. Excellent job. So everyone, you know, looking at these codes today, um, you know, you can really see how they really, really thought this through. They thought about it. They put a lot of effort into making sure that they would keep themselves and their pilot safe with all of these different things. We talked about camouflage. We talked about Morse code. We talked about flag code. All of these things were really, really helpful uh, to, to be able to stay safe out there using their codes. So I just want to uh, wrap up today and see if we've got any other questions uh, before heading out. Any other questions we got today at all? Do they still use codes in the military today? Absolutely. They still use signal flag code. Uh, they still use Morse code and a whole bunch of other codes too. But of course, since everyone you know knows things like Morse code or the signal flags now, um, they actually now have sort of used it in their own special way. So again, the codes within the codes uh, have taken on kind of a new life. For instance, signal flags, right? You've got the letter or the number that means something if you put it together. But now the single ones actually are whole phrases too. So if you ever see just one flag waving around, it could mean maybe someone went overboard or that they need fuel or maybe something's on fire. So definitely they still use a lot of codes today, uh, but they're just kind of using a little slightly different now to uh, make it a little more special and unique to their situations. All right, any other questions? Are Avengers still flown in the Navy? No. Uh, Avengers entered service in 1942 during World War II. Uh, they were used through the 1960s, but then by the time you know that was happening, you know, technology is getting better and improved so much. Now we had jet planes; they're going much faster, a lot more effective for what they were doing at the time. So the Avengers were either scrapped or just sold off. Um, a lot of them found new life, helping actually to put out forest forest fires. Um, they could carry you know all of that weight from the torpedoes, so the water that they could load up there really helpful for that. They also would dump uh, pesticides on fields. So, you know, really helpful for uh, instances like that. But then also you have a lot of plane buffs. Maybe you're out there, uh, you know, got their hands on them too. So now they use them for demonstrations at plane shows as well, reenactments, that sort of thing. But no, the Navy no longer uses them anymore because they've got much cooler, faster planes too. Although I do love the adventure, I will say. All right, maybe one last question. How many planes do you have at the museum now? So uh, I believe we currently have uh, 28 aircraft on display, including our newest acquisition, the Douglas Skyray, which we just craned up onto our flight deck not too long ago. Maybe some of you were tuning in for some of that exciting coverage as we got our newest plane. Uh, and also, of course, we've got the British Airways Concorde, um, which was a commercial jet. Um, we've also got a Cold War era submarine, the Growler, and uh, also the NASA Space Shuttle, the Enterprise, and it's all housed within or around uh, the Intrepid itself, which is, of course, a National Historic Landmark, too. So lots of cool stuff to see and do here. Um, we would love to have you back on site. Um, does the Intrepid as a museum have a street address? We kind of have a funny street address because we are, like, in the water. So we say it's, uh, it's like, the plaza kind of area where it's the intersection of uh, 46th and 12th Avenue. Yes, very close. Uh, so everyone, my friends, um, if you do have any other questions about our programs, please do feel free to reach out to us through our website, intrepidmuseum.org, um, or also, of course, through any of our streaming sites uh, or social media platforms. I would like to thank you all so much for playing along and watching our program today. As you know, the museum has introduced a number of new live streams just like these, so please do follow and subscribe to this channel or visit our website for the 
latest streaming schedule. Uh, and also, if you enjoyed this program, I encourage you to fill out a quick survey that you can find linked to in the chat as well. Uh, now, our museum is back open to the public seven days a week from 10 to 5 p.m. So if you're in the neighborhood or passing on by, we'd love to see you at the ship in person where you can check out a number of these really cool spaces and techniques and planes and the growler and the shuttle and everything else that I just mentioned and the new Skyray uh, as well in person yourself. So come on by. All right, my friends. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, hopefully we will see you on site or online uh, for another upcoming virtual Intrepid adventure. So see you next time. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>